uh, one of the men who was most responsible for codifying uh, medieval magic during the early Renaissance period was uh, was uh, an abbot, a young abbot of a monastery named Trithemius. And, and uh, Trithemius was, of course, the mentor of Cornelius Agrippa, whom most all of us in the hermetic science have heard of, of course. Now, um, one of the things that uh, we need to discuss here at this point is the relationship between Kabbalah and alchemy and, and with uh, hermetic science. Now, alchemy is... Uh, direct, directly connected with with hermetic or early hermetic science, Greco-Egyptian hermetic science. In fact, alchemy has been referred to as the as the the art of chem. Alchemy, chem was the ancient name for Egypt. And um, alchemy, I used to think when I first got started in in uh, the hermetic tradition, I first got started, I I had a kind of a Hmm, kind of an attitude toward alchemy, like there was a psychological process. And I have since learned that alchemy is really, really uh, is uh, the spigeric art of alchemy. It really does affect matter, and really does affect uh, uh, substances and conditions outside of the psychological condition of the operator. And what the reason for this is, is that the alchemist, the alchemist uses his own desire and his own willpower and his own, his own faith in his own power to create the effect on outside matter and to create medicines and to create to trans uh, to transmute uh, metals to do these various uh what seem like miraculous operations and actually in in uh they do they do work and the reason for this and we're beginning to find out now is that the observer really does affect the experiment in regular physics in regular chemistry, yes, the observer will. But the difference between alchemy and, and chemistry, in a in a um, technical sense, is that the chemist performs an operation in such a mechanical way that if he writes it all down and does it without any uh, particular emotional involvement in it or any particular psychological involvement in it. He wants to say, okay, we bring this to such and such a temperature, and we do this, we add this, so much of this, so much of that, and we do this, and this, that, and the other thing, and we, and this is a replicatable experiment. And with scientific rigor, it's a replicatable experiment. Now, that's the way a chemist does it. The alchemist, on the other hand, he goes through the slow cooking process, and he is like a gourmet cook. He he simmers, and as he simmers, and of course the molecules naturally are are agitated as he slowly simmers this thing, and then his his simmering, his patience and his desire, that is what what generates uh, the change, what generates the transformation. Well, now that's not replicatable. You can't just say, "Oh, okay." And at this point, desire what you want, and you get it, because this means that the operator himself, his psyche, his uh, desire, his his magical power, if you will, or alchemical uh, expertise, if you will, is going to affect the the outcome. That's the real difference between alchemy and and uh, and science. Now. One of the things that has has actually hurt uh, her hermetic science and tended to discredit it was the whole Cartesian process of uh, that occurred in the in the late Renaissance, where we began in the and in the age of so-called reason and the age of enlightenment, where we began to to uh, get away from what we call superstition and 
where we had replicatable experiments for everything. Everything had to be written down. It had to be just done expert way. And if you couldn't weigh it, you couldn't weigh it and measure it. If you couldn't uh, define it, if you couldn't uh, completely uh, analyze it, then it wasn't important and it didn't exist. And the human imagination was downgraded. And this, of course, was a sad thing because the human imagination is the greatest power we have. And especially if you're a believer in hermetic science, you know that the human imagination, everything starts with the human imagination. What was it uh, in that, uh, the Conan movie that Arnold was in, you know, where they had the riddle of steel? And he says, well, which is stronger, flesh or steel? Flesh is stronger because flesh is much stronger. Uh, steel is, is inert. It's the flesh that wields it. And this is uh, the truth about the imagination. Everything that we have created was first was first imagined in our imagination. Now, this is one of the big secrets behind the Kabbalah and behind the Hermetic philosophy is the idea of magical preforms, and the idea that if you have a if you have in your imagination first uh, the form of something, the idea of something, that, and if you, if you really desire it and you imagine it strongly enough and clearly enough, it will come about. And that's the first stage of it. And that's the most dynamic stage of it. And after it's completed and after it's built and after it, then it's, then it's starting to decay. It's static at that point. So the, really the imagination, the, the original vision of a thing has, has more dynamism and more power than the finished product itself. Um, I, I think that, uh, that we, we lose sight of the power of the imagination and, and with all of our engineering dictum, about uh, science, we, 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 we feel that the, we, we downgrade the imagination. We don't realize this. Now, some years back, a scientist himself wrote a book called The, um, uh, the, um, um, oh, it's the Truth About Scientific Revelations by Kahn. I think it's like the fellow by the name of Kahn. Anyway, he pointed out in this book that almost 90% of the great breakthroughs in science, of the actual breakthroughs, were not a result of direct research. They were a result of an inspiration. The scientist struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled and did all these experiments. Then he went to bed and woke up the next morning and he suddenly realized how to do it. That inspiration is is really is the key to scientific advancement. And so uh, one of the things we would like to um, do with, uh, with magic is we would like to perfect and to fine tune and perfect and make a, make a creative process, a magical creative process out of training our imagination and out of searching into the deep mind to bring up visions that are even beyond ourselves, that are way beyond ourselves. One of the things I think uh, that we should remember in that regard is that, uh, I think it was Socrates, wasn't it Socrates who said um, that uh, we don't learn anything, we just remember things. Well, the implications of that, of course, are awesome. Now, let's for a moment mention our modern, one of our modern hermetic philosophers, Carl Jung. Now, Carl Jung came up with a concept which is very important in modern magic. Uh, his concept of the collective unconscious. And this idea of Carl Jung's is perfectly fits in with the Hermetic philosophy because Carl Jung had this idea that, that if you go down into the unconscious deep enough, you get into what is called the collective unconscious of the, of the human race. And the, this collective unconscious is where the archetypes, where the, the, the ancient pagan gods, 
where the uh, the savior architect uh, the, the savior archetype and the and the the archetype of the trickster and all these various mythological figures where they reside and they're universal and and we we can access them and if we think about hermetic philosophy says that each one of us is the eyes and the ears of God. Each one of us has this link to, to God. This means that each one of us is connected to God. So there is this this concept of the universal mind, and which fits perfectly well into what Jung is talking about with the collective unconscious. Now, we can tap into that. So when we say that we're going to evoke a spirit, or we're going to invoke an angel. Now, I can I can say, well, oh, yeah, we'll do this. We'll do it in a crystal ball. We'll do it in a dark mirror. We'll do we'll do this. But I don't expect that if you see this spirit in the mirror, in the dark mirror, I don't expect that somebody can photograph it. I don't expect that you're going to see it the same way I see it. We know it's subjective. And yet, at the same time, we are accessing this universal mind. We're, we're beyond ourselves. We're down into the collective unconscious of the race itself. And we're, uh, and we're, uh, we're on a different level, even though we are using our own minds and we're not extra-personalizing this thing where it can jump out and bite us or anything like that. No. No, this is unfortunate that we've gotten around to, uh, and this is a Western thing primarily, that we've gotten around to the point where we think that unless we can actually uh, photograph the spirit, uh, unless the spirit uh, looks appears the same and speaks the same to everybody in the circle or whatever, that it's not really real, uh, it's not really really happening or whatever. This, this is not the way magic works, and magic never has worked this way. And I can tell you right now that that when we talk in magic about about uh, spirits, we use that, and we use the term disembodied spirits. We mean exactly that. These spirits are not they're not uh, physical entities that you can photograph. They're not supposed to be, but yet they have a very definite transpersonal reality. They are bigger than you are, and they're they're a lot. Yeah, they, they extend a lot further than you do, because if you are the eyes and ears of God, then you have access. Ultimately, you have access to the whole universe. There's nothing. There's no boundaries to the human imagination. If the human imagination is connected to uh, to the, the universal mind, which it is.